In this tutorial, we will explore the one-point perspective drawing and learn how to create a beautiful alley scene. Grab your markers and pens to get ready to unleash your creativity. In the first chapter, we will cover the basics of drawing a simple scene with one-point perspective. This method of drawing is all about creating the illusion of depth and space on a flat surface. In chapter 2, I will walk you through my creation of this drawing step by step. Don't worry if you are a beginner. With some guidance and a little bit of practice, you will find that drawing an alley using one-point perspective is easier than it appears. Before we start our drawing, I want to show you the cool pixel art lighting decoration device, Pixel 64 from Devoom. Thanks to Devoom for sponsoring today's video. I was really excited to receive this device from Devoom. Pixel art always holds a special place in my heart and brings back memories of playing video games in my childhood. Pixel 64 is equipped with both a power cord and a USB cable. You have the option of plug it into a wall outlet or connecting it to your computer. It comes with hooks for wall mounting, or you can display it on the desk with the included stand. This device comes with a well-designed app. With the app, you can easily choose from a variety of pixel art designs shared by many amazing artists or even create your own to display on this device. It also has other functions such as a clock, timer, or display of your social account status. With Valentine's Day just around the corner, there are many cute Valentine's Day themed pixel animations on the app to choose from. Once you select it, it will quickly display on the screen. If you come across some designs you really like, you can add them to your favorite list and let the device cycle through these designs, adding a touch of customization to your space. You can also turn your artwork into pixel art using this app. Here I'm uploading my tree drawings to the app and it's turned into a cute pixel art that I can display on my desk. In the future, I'm looking forward to make some pixel art. It's both fun and relaxing. This can be a very nice gift for Valentine's Day. You can check the link in the description for more information. Without further ado, let's start our drawing. In this chapter, we will learn one-point perspective quickly and do some very simple practice. I won't go into excessive details, but rather offer information that can be directly used in our drawing later. First, let's take a look at a couple real-life pictures to see how one-point perspective looks in a real world. I have highlighted the upper edges of each building. Let's see what will happen if we extend these lines. As you can see, they all eventually meet at the same point. In one-point perspective drawing, we call this point a vanishing point. In a perspective drawing, all lines that are parallel to each other in the actual scene will converge to the same vanishing point. Now let me draw a horizontal line across this point. This line is referred to as the horizon line and is positioned approximately in the center of the picture. The exact location of the horizon line will vary depending on the viewpoint of the observer. All vertical lines remain perpendicular to the horizon line and are not affected by perspective. Let's examine another picture. I will trace the horizontal edges of the windows and the buildings, and if we extend them, they will also converge to a single point. As you can see in this picture, the horizon line is much lower. Later when we are drawing in one-point perspective, make sure that all horizontal edges of buildings, windows, and doors converge towards the vanishing point. Let's do some simple drawings to help us practice using this technique.
Here, I'm drawing a top view of the buildings. Let's consider each square as a block of the building. Imagine you are standing in the center of the road and facing the buildings. Try to imagine what will we see. Now, let's transfer your imagination to paper. To start, draw a horizon line at the center of the paper. Then draw a dot in the center of the horizon line, which will be the vanishing point. Next, draw the road. Starting from the vanishing point, draw two diagonal lines towards you. Make them roughly symmetrical. Now let's draw two guidelines for the top and the bottom edges of the building. Next, drawing the building will be very easy. For building 1 and 6, in this view, we can only see their sides are facing the road. Draw one vertical line along the left side and right side of the frame. To draw the top and the bottom edges of the building, just trace the guideline we just created. Now move to building 2 and 5. Remember to leave some space between the two buildings. Start by drawing two vertical lines across our guidelines. Then draw two horizontal lines on the top and the bottom to finish the side of the building that is facing us. In one point perspective, the side of the cuboid that faces directly towards the viewer is not affected by the perspective and is drawn at the rectangle, while all other horizontal lines converge at the vanishing point, except angled lines such as a sloped roof. To draw the sides are facing the road, using the same method we did for building 1 and 6. Repeat this process for the rest of the buildings. To create the illusion of depth, ensure that the distance between buildings and the size of the buildings gets smaller as they move away from the viewer. After you finish drawing each building, erase any pencil outlines. To add more visual interest, you can draw some scribbled lines in the background to represent trees and the sky. Congratulations, you have just drawn a city street view using one-point perspective. It can take some time to become proficient in drawing using one-point perspective. Let's do another practice. This time, the locations of some of the buildings will be changed. Building 1 and 2 will share a same wall, while building 5 and 6 will share a wall and be positioned further back than building 1 and 2. Instead of standing in the middle of the road, we will move slightly towards the right side. What will we see this time? Take a break from the video and try using the method we just learned to draw this new scene. Once you are finished, come back to see how it's done. First, draw the horizon line. Second, choose the vanishing point. This time, it won't be in the center. The location of the vanishing point will change depending on the position of the observer. Draw diagonal lines converging to the vanishing point, determining the height of the building and the width of the road. Then draw vertical lines on each side to position the buildings. From this view, the buildings on the right side will appear skinnier. Building 4 will be very narrow. So I realized that some of the building in my top view 
when not in the right spot. Compared to the perspective view I'm drawing, I wasn't really focusing on being very precise. But to avoid any confusion, I redrew the top view so it matches my current perspective drawing. Once the pencil sketch is completed, trace it with a pen. To draw windows, it's also very easy. Draw more diagonal lines from the vanishing point to determine the height of the window. Then draw vertical lines to complete each window. Remember, as the windows move away from us, they will appear smaller and skinnier. If you want to add some bricks or tiles on the ground, we can also use the same method to draw. Lastly, to complete our little sketch, let's draw some trees and mountains in the background. Congratulations on finishing this drawing with me. I hope you have a good understanding of how to use one-point perspective to draw a street view now. In the next chapter, I will demonstrate how to create a more detailed version using one-point perspective. Welcome to chapter 2 of our tutorial. In this chapter, we will use the same method we learned in chapter 1 to draw a flowery alley scene. Before I start this drawing, I think about how this scene looks like in a 3D space. I will have a straight road and buildings on both sides. But in the background, I will add some buildings that are very far away from the viewer. Keep in mind that buildings in different directions of the road won't share the same vanishing points with other buildings in the front, since they are not parallel to each other. I will stand in the middle to the right to look at the scene. I like to draw doors first to set a height reference for other things I will draw later. I start by drawing the big frame for all doors and windows. Then I will come back to add more details.
If you want to learn details of how to draw a house like this, feel free to check my other tutorials. Here I will just estimate the angle of the roof. For the few buildings in the far back, you don't need to use one point perspective to draw them if they are not facing the same road as other buildings. You can just randomly draw some houses overlapping each other. Don't get overwhelmed and add too many details in the background. When drawing doors or windows, it's important to consider the depth of the wall as well. To achieve this in one point perspective, follow these steps. First, draw the frame of the wall opening. The horizontal lines should converge at the vanishing point, while the vertical line remains unaffected by the perspective. Second, draw a horizontal line across the right corner of the frame. This line represents the thickness of the wall. Next, draw another vertical line next to the right side of the wall to complete the side that faces the viewer. Draw another guideline from the vanishing point, then trace this line to complete the top side of the wall opening. Repeat this process to draw the windows frame. The same method can be applied to doors. When drawing windows or doors, it's important to consider whether you want to include the wall part or not. If the frame extends out of the wall, there is no need to draw the wall portion. This choice ultimately comes down to the look you want to achieve in your drawing. In this case, I have decided to include the wall section. Later when I add values to shade it, I believe it will help create more depth in my drawing. In this scene, the windows on the right side should appear much narrower. Here I think I made them too wide. I will fix them later. add more depth to the drawing, I decided to add two street lights and drew the flower parts smaller as they move far away from us. talk about how to draw roses in the line work part. Drawing plants can be a little bit challenging, as the leaves tend to appear random, however, you will discover various patterns for different plants.
As I move forward, I will add more details to each element of the drawing and double check my one point perspective. Before I add ink, I will clean up some lines to make it easier to see where to trace. Before adding ink to your drawing, it's important to consider the line style you'd like to use. A simple way to experiment is by drawing two dots and to see if you can draw a rough straight line to connect them. The line style I primarily use involves quick acceleration, resulting in crisp lines. However, it can be difficult to control the direction. Sometimes I'm able to draw a perfectly straight line, but other times I miss the direction. Let's draw a cuboid using this line style. We will compare it to another line style in a minute. Another way of drawing lines is to maintain a consistent speed, either fast or slow, depending on your skill level. When comparing two cuboids drawn using different line styles, in my opinion, the second drawing appears more calm and steady, while the first drawing appears more crisp and loose. You can choose any style you prefer or combine them together. For things in the foreground, I use a 0.3mm pen. And for buildings in the background, I will switch to a thinner pen. Although it may seem like a small difference, all the small details will add up and create more depth in your drawing. When drawing long straight lines, try not to hold your pen too low. Holding it a little bit higher will make it easier to draw. Remember, we don't need to be perfect when drawing these lines. Before drawing a line, I often shake my hand a few times as a form of practice. I do this more often for longer lines as I want to ensure my line stays on track. If you make a big mistake, don't worry, you can always cover it with a white gel pen later.
taking a short break can help you refocus and improve the quality of your lines. For example, when I'm drawing the lights, I felt tired and my lines were shaky. So I took a break, then come back to finish the rest of the drawing. To draw roses, you can start by loosely drawing a small triangle in the center and then surrounding it with curved lines. The focus should be on capturing the essence of the form rather than accuracy. When drawing leaves, make sure to vary their shape and avoid symmetry. Draw a rosebud. Start with a water drop shape. Add additional curved lines in the center. The key is to relax your hand and let your pen flow freely. Now come back to our drawing. When drawing plants, I don't trace my pencil outline strictly. When drawing leaves, make sure to vary the angles to avoid a flat appearance. 
Check out my other tutorials for more information on drawing flowers. The link will be in the right corner. draw every single brick on the ground. I don't want the drawing to look cluttered.
Before we start the coloring part, I want to quickly talk about how many markers you will need. You will need about 11 markers, 3 green colors for the plants, 1 red for the rose, but if you have 2 will be even better, 2 light sand or beige colors for the building, 2 blue colors for the door, windows, and sky, 2 warm gray colors for the shadows on the ground. While I use more colors in this drawing, you don't need as many. When you have fewer colors, focus on creating different shades of the same color. One of the hardest part for me is figuring out what color scheme to use. I wanted to have a strong lighting, but I also wanted to keep the coloring process simple and loose. In this drawing, I made the light source come from the left side. So I won't add too many colors on the buildings on the right side to show the lighting. For all the plants, I use the same set of greens to keep it consistent. In my previous drawings, I usually switch greens for different plants to add a variety. But for this drawing, I wanted to keep it simple. I want the drawing to have a warm vibe, so I use warm grey for the shadows. To add some contrast, I make the area closest to the light look darker. Just remember that shadows have different values from dark to light.
If you have watched my other tutorials, I have often mentioned that when coloring buildings, your marker strokes can follow the direction of the plane. To color the walls here, most of the time I use vertical strokes or have the strokes direction converge at the vanishing point. These two potted plants are in the shadow, so they will appear much darker than all the plants in the drawing. When adding shading to the potted plants, use a sphere form as a reference. Since most of plants in this drawing are very small, the stroke technique is not as important. Instead, focus on adding darker values to the lower parts of the plants to create volume. Most of the time, shading can be achieved with just a few small strokes and dots, so don't try to use too many darker colors. I tried a new way to color the sky in this drawing. Normally, I draw some sharp and curved strokes for a pop of color, but this time I wanted to try something different. I went for a horizontal back and forth motion to let the ink soak the paper, creating soft edges and a watercolor-like texture. Plus, I made sure to create some shapes using negative space. For the doors and the windows, I added some dark values to the wall part, especially on the upper parts that get the least light. I also made sure to emphasize the shadows under the roof, 
it adds more depth to the house. When coloring the rose, pay attention to the parts with dense leaves and add more darker values there to create depth and dimension. While it's tempting to add more details, but it's best to keep it simple here. Focus on creating an overall cohesive look by adding shading where necessary and let the rose's natural form shine through. I choose not to color the street light as it is located in the light area of the drawing. This decision was made to increase the contrast between the shadow and the light areas and to keep the focus on the middle to the left of the drawing. Adding too many details to the street light could distract from the focal point.
before I keep adding darker values, I'm going to use a gel pen to add highlights and see how the drawing looks. Based on that, I will decide how much darker colors I need to keep adding. I'm actually slowing down my pace now and taking some small breaks to come back to coloring. After staring at my drawing for too long, my eyes get tired and I often add too much dark color, which makes the drawing look heavy and messy. For example, I think I added too much dark colors on the house in the far back, so later I will use a gel pen to lighten up some areas. Things in the foreground will appear more detailed, so you can use a pen to add a little texture to the bricks that are closer to you. At the very last, you can use a black brush pen to draw some thick lines on things in the foreground. This will further increase the contrast between the foreground and the background. I 
Hi there, we have finally arrived at the final stage of the drawing. You can spend a bit more time fine-tuning details and clean up any lines that may seem out of place. I hope you had fun following along with this tutorial and learned how to use one-point perspective in your drawing. Don't be shy, leave me a comment if you have any questions or just want to share your thoughts. Looking forward to our next creative adventure together.